It wants to question the value of comics and communication. You should have been here for that talk when it was standing room only. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, which I, I completely endorse. I think it, it, the more creative we can be in our communication, the better. Um, so just a very brief piece about me and why I was uh, reeled in to work on this talk. So I uh, work as a consultant in entomological and agricultural communications. Um, what's most relevant for this talk is that um, in 2014, I applied for and was uh, accepted into the Science Policy Fellows Program. So for the past two years, I've been receiving training via ESA uh, on how to do science policy communication, essentially. And so I'm building on a lot of the things that we've learned as a part of that program. So I do a lot of other things in my career, some science editing, I do some teaching, uh, but really the core across everything is communication. And that is obviously the theme of the symposium and an emerging theme throughout our science. When I was getting on the plane to come to this meeting, uh, there's a big ad in the, uh, in the airport that says, more science, less fear. If only it were that easy, right? If we would just throw our science the logic would be perceived and communication done. Fortunately, it's not that easy. This happens to be an ad from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, so that's sort of one of their monikers for, for getting their word out about science, but uh, that doesn't always work. Of course, uh, many of you probably saw, again, the theme of communications, the importance of communications, uh, really, was bubbling last year at the ESA meeting, and Dr. Baron Baum, our current ESA president, started to talk about that. And then most recently, uh, she had the editorial in Science on speaking of insects, completely focused on the importance of science communication. And so this is a front and center topic that uh, is being acknowledged at all levels of our society. It's no longer considered the soft part of science, it's considered the part that makes our science relevant. Uh, so one way to gauge how we are doing in science communication is to look at the value. Uh, one way to look at value is to look at the money associated with science. Uh, this is the total spending uh, by the U.S. federal government by category. Uh, we can see that um, most of the spending is Social Security and Employment Labor, Medicare Health, and Military. If we combine science, energy and environment, and food and agriculture, that's about 6% of the total budget. So in terms of the impact that we're able to, uh, the perceived impact of the importance of our work, it's about 6% of what's considered important. So uh, this just gives us a kind of a measure of the room, the impact we can still make. So why should we specifically, as scientists, be communicating about science policy or communicating to help shape policy? So the first one that we just touched on in the last slide is funding, of course. Uh, we all need money to do the work that we want to do. Um, another reason that might not be immediately apparent is we may actually be very concerned about regulations that directly affect the ability of us to do our research. These could be regulations about a particular pesticide that we're interested to look at the effects of, um, something like the use, the regulations related to the use of human and vertebrate subjects might have directly affect our research. Um, maybe we want to work with a quarantine or invasive pest, so all of these things have regulations and policies that uh, dictate how they can be used, and we may want to advocate for changes in some of those. Um, this is an interesting one to me, and one that has emerged as a part of the Science Policy Fellows programs, but I think there's an argument to be made that as scientists, we actually have an ethical responsibility or obligation to, to communicate our work and to, uh, to have, make sure that it's having an impact. So um, this particular author, Resnick, in his paper, The Ethics of Science, um, actually said that if scientists have information that can, quote, prevent harmful consequences and promote beneficial ones, there's an ethical responsibility to share it. And I think that's a fair argument. If we have information that can make a difference in the world to impact human health, impact the ability to feed the world, uh, we should be making sure that that information is actually being used. Um, and then last, uh, on a more personal note, I think it actually makes us better scientists when we engage with non-scientists. 
because we are, that's where you often get the person who is going to ask the question that you haven't thought of because you are in the trenches and in the details of your work. And when you communicate with non-scientists, they're often the ones who are going to say the most obvious question that you have not um, been able to come up for air for and, and see about your own research. So I think it also helps us to improve our science. Okay, great, I'm sold. I want to communicate with policymakers about my work. How do I do it? So let's get into some tips and tricks. Um, the number one, so in being a part of the Science Policy Fellows Program and doing personal research in the area, the number one thing is to know your audience. Okay, so who are policymakers? Uh, at the most uh, defined level, they're simply people who have the power to determine policy that will affect change at local, national, or international levels, typically elected officials, and generally not scientists. So Paul, what do policymakers care about? They care about uh, what their voters care about. They want to have positive press and they want to get reelected. Um, presumably because they care about the work that they're doing and they think that they can do a good job on behalf of their voters. And so part of knowing your audience is to do a little bit of homework. Um, number one, policymakers are most interested in the humans in their own district, their voters. <laughs> so knowing the people that are in your district is important. Um, and knowing a little bit about votes that they've done in the past uh, helps to set the stage for kind of knowing uh, their past experience with issues that might be of interest to you. So a little compare and contrast between scientists and policymakers and why sometimes we have a, a disconnect in the way that we communicate. Scientists are very busy, so we are, as we all know, are working late at night and, and doing what we need to do. Policymakers are also very busy, so there is a need for us to temper uh, the amount of work we have to do to, and, and put some of that aside to make time for communicating, and policymakers are very busy, so there's a need to try to catch their attention, which can be hard. Scientists are discovery-oriented. We are trying to find out new things that aren't known. Policymakers are decision-oriented. They need to take information and make a decision with it. Scientists, we are of the mindset, more research is needed. And policymakers are, I need to vote on this bill today. Okay, so we are more comfortable with uncertainty. Policymakers don't always have that luxury. And as scientists, we tend to be very focused on one subject in a lot of detail, and policymakers work on every subject, not in a lot of detail. And a good illustration of this is, as a part of the fellows program, we were meeting with legislative offices, and we met with a staffer of uh, one of my Connecticut senators. And we walk in the room, and she's like, okay, who are you? I just got done with the sesame allergy people. What are, what are you gonna tell me about? <laughs> so they are going through these meetings with <laughs> completely different subjects and we're like we're here to say insects are cool you know? <laughs> so you know they are switching um, their mindsets very quickly they're very um, smart and engaged people who really care about what they're doing but they get a lot of different subjects in the course of the day so to summarize kind of this disconnect between scientists and policymakers, we often end up in a situation where um, this presenter, uh, Lupia, he presented in a AAAS symposium on science communication. We end up that we are telling people very true things that are not useful to them. So we need to do a better job of making sure that we are still truthful, but also honing our information to also be useful to the policymakers. So how do we supply useful information? Well, again, building on what um, this uh, presenter Lupia presented, persuasion happens when we confuse what people already know with what we want to teach them. So we need to find that point of commonality so that they're making connections. Uh, we need to connect the information that we have with their experience. And so a policymaker's experience is often going to be their, their constituents' experience and what's important to them in their state. 
So in terms of some practical tips for doing this, I have uh, become a fan of this book, Marketing for Scientists, by Mark Kushner. He actually spoke in a symposium that um, myself and Richard Levine uh, from ESA organized last year, and he did a workshop. Uh, Mark is actually a, uh, an astronomer, and so he studies planets, but he is also a country songwriter, and he was very interested in selling some of his country songs to, to Nashville. And so he said, look, I am a smart guy, you know, I am a rocket scientist, <laughs> maybe it does take a rocket scientist to figure out how to communicate about science and actually sell country songs. <laughs> So he got into the marketing literature and uh, read everything he could about the, you know, the practices and of marketing, and has honed them to how can we apply those to, uh, to science. And his fundamental theorem that he calls it of science marketing is everything that you get from other people comes because you met someone else's needs or desires. So just digest that for a moment. Essentially. This goes back to knowing your audience, and it also goes back to being very, very empathetic with the person that you're trying to communicate with. So you are trying to understand their point of view so that uh, they will be receptive to your information. Um, and this is essentially what marketing does. Marketing is not successful unless ultimately you sell a product, but you only sell a product if you're meeting someone's need, right? The product that we're trying to sell is our science. So I encourage you, this is not a, a heavy tome, I encourage you to, if you're interested in that topic, to get into it a bit more. Um, so what's very interesting too about this book is actually Mark begins with essentially an entomological example. Um, so, and he begins with a policy related example of the importance of marketing. And so he gives this example of in 1995, the US House of Representatives was preparing to cut the Endangered Species Act by $16 million. And uh, Newt Gingrich at the time was saying, ah, extinction, that's just the way life is. We don't need this, this ESA. Uh, so a group of scientists, including Thomas Eisner, pictured here, um, ESA fellow, Thomas Eisner, also known as the father of chemical ecology, worked with bombardier beetles. Um, he was one of those scientists that met with Gingrich. And at the meeting, he brought a small vial with a cutting that happened to be from a mint plant in Florida, and he thought that it might have interesting insecticidal properties. So he just brought this little vial with a leaf in it to that meeting. And uh, Gingrich was intrigued, like, what? okay, tell me more, this little, this little um, tangible prop. And he asked to keep the vial, and in the end, they d decided not to cut the ESA bill and um, not, not let the, uh, the uh, bill go to the floor for a vote, and so the ESA did not get gutted that particular time. Um, and I think the take home message from this was that he didn't come in there as a scientist like, I know all the information and you're trying to cut this bill and we need to save species. He came in technically much softer and he started a conversation and he was tangible and he related to something that could be relatable to a real voter concern, like having interesting insecticides that you know, can help to protect our food. So he didn't come in there with facts and statistics and charts that were persuasive and logical. He came in in a very human, uh, in a human way that um, a non-scientist could relate to. So once again, I love that this is one of our entomologists that we can claim from this story. So in the book, he also has um, special, so here's some tips and tricks from the book that I'll, I'll go through quickly. Again, there are much more detail from the book, but these apply directly to communicating for policy. Um, one is storytelling. Storytelling makes your research more memorable. If you come in and say, I work with this parasitoid and it's going to help save the crops and, um, yeah, and we're, it's really important and I really am interested in the interaction. So, Okay, or if you say like, so, imagine you're in a cornfield, you know, and you, why, you know, make it engaging, tell a story, or say like, one night in the lab, I was sitting there by the microscope, and boom, I saw it, the nematode, you know, or whatever it was. Um, that is much more memorable, right? And in the scope of that person who has talked about sesame allergies, and now you've come in and I want to talk about entomology, 
that's what you need to do. Um, the props, uh, that was in the, the story that we just said, don't be shy about having a, a tangible prop. Um, I worked with uh, bead pod model virus. It causes the soybeans to be very modeled. Um, you know, if I wanted to come in there, I could have two vials of soybeans. One, the pretty ones that everyone wants to sell, and one, the modeled ones. Like, boom, you know, effect of preventing this disease is, is easily visible. Uh, enthusiasm and optimism. You know, as scientists, we sort of, we want to be logical, Dr. Fox, but emotion is powerful. Just being excited about your work goes a very long way. Um, the emotion about your work is pro in a situation of communicating to a non-scientist is probably more powerful than the details of your work. Um, the king of this, of course, is Steve Jobs, you know, revolutionary, new phone, you know, he was the king of using these words. Don't, don't be afraid to say your work is remarkable or cool or stunning. You know. um, sound bites. So you would think like, oh, sound bites, that is like absolutely something I wouldn't want to touch. But, you know, we can think of sound, an effective sound bite can actually be seen more as smarting up versus dumbing down. Um, a friend of mine is working with, um, with these rodent bait boxes to help try to keep um, tick populations down around homes. And she could say like, oh, I'm working with these rodent bait bo boxes that are going to you know, kill the ticks on the rodents. Or she could say, it's like having an invisible force field around your home. <laughs> oh, that's a sound bite. And that creates a much more visible picture to a non-scientist, right? Um, brand name. You might think, brand name, how does that apply to my science? The term integrated pest management, that's a brand name. You know, I could say, oh, a way to use multiple tactics to manage insect populations, or integrated pest management, IPM. That's, you know, IPM, KFC, you know? <laughs> So there are ways to uh, develop brands for your work. And last, again, this uh, seems like a, a, a gimmick, but the rule of three really does work. And we do sort of all use this, often in titles for our work, but the, um, you know, just grouping things in threes. And there is psychological research to support why that works. So uh, we say, you know, for example, this new insecticide has low toxicity to mammals, is, prone, is not prone to leaching, and provides a new mode of action for this pest. So one, two, three. That will help to make your work more memorable. So, but we also have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, science, in science as we know, conclusions are not always certain, and we estimate the degree of our certainty with statistics. Um, but policy relevant conclusions may depend on technical judgments that our audiences are incapable of evaluating. Okay, so leaving too much uncertainty to the policymaker saying, you know, well, this has a such and such confidence interval. That's, that's hard for a non-scientist to gauge the relative importance of that information. Uh, so as what we need to do is do a better job of bridging the gap between the data and how the data can be used for decision making. And um, this woman, uh, Barron, wrote a book called Escape from the Ivory Tower, and her suggestion is so that you never feel like you're sacrificing your role as a scientist, you can put on different hats in the conversation. As a scientist, I can tell you that we are you know, 68% confident that this particular result will happen. But as a citizen and a human, I can tell you that if we don't take action, I'm really concerned about the effect of this on my grandchildren. You know, we can do that. You still probably have a gut opinion about the impact of your science, and it's okay to reflect that, but without sacrificing your scientific integrity. So there are two types of policy issues when you're going to speak with someone or to advocate on an issue. One are things that are already on the agenda, Zika, pollinator health, those are there. The other, and some of the, the things we've been talking about would be if you're talking to someone about something that's already on their, their agenda. The other type of policy issues are things that you know are really important, but no one else knows are important yet, and you want to get those things on the agenda. And so how do you get something that is not on anybody's radar onto the agenda for policy? Um, and so I think the place to start is you've got to get some media attention. 
If you really want to get something on a national scale, and to get the media attention, then you will get the public attention. And if you can get public attention, then you can get the policymaker attention, because the policymakers are interested in what their constituents are interested in. Okay, so how do we get the media attention? Um, so, uh, Gwen Pearson already had to leave, but of course, um, having a popular uh, Twitter account can be one way to just catch attention, and there are a lot of journalists that are following very popular uh, Twitter accounts. Um, you can promote your work on a popular news site or blog, so Entomology Today is very visible, and so if I'm a journalist just kind of looking for an interesting story, that might start to be a source that I would, I would be consulting with. Um, there are, of course, many others that you could try to get your work promoted on. Um, make videos of your work. So there are two that I'm going to highlight that I really like. Um, one is Adrian Smith. He uh, received an award at this meeting, I believe, for science communication. <laughs> and at last year's meeting, he won the YouTube Your Entomology contest as well. So um, he, what he does is he makes this series called Explained by the Author, and he makes short videos that explain the, you know, the technical scientific papers, but they're two or three minute videos. And I love this particular one because he's basically doing this video with his mom and trying to explain his ant queen chemical research with his mom. And it's, it's very funny, very effective, and it uh, you know, gets the point across of this very technical paper in a fun and engaging way. And likewise, I'm going to shout out our um, I, I incoming Vice President-elect Bob Peterson. He is also doing this, making short two-minute videos to, pro to explain um, the core of what is in his papers. And so again, there's no reason, excuse me, we can't be doing this because, um, you know, don't, don't let someone else <laughs> take control of your work. You know, promote it the way that you think is, is, um, is appropriate and get the word out. And these are fun to watch. It, even as a scientist, like for me to see like Bob's video, and then I'm like, oh yeah, wait, let me go look at the paper. It, it works, even for us as scientists. So just, uh, you probably know some about what ESA is doing because Dr. Berenbaum has talked about it, but um, our society has uh, really stepped up its game in terms of being engaged in policy. Um, quarterly, you may not know this, but the ESA puts out a science policy newsletter on all of the bills that are and votes that are upcoming and what ESA has been doing to engage in Washington, D.C. in policy. And these are available on the ESA website. Also, um, ESA has reinvigorated its position statement program, and so there are committees that work to write position statements on uh, important topics. Um, this one's on invasive species. We have one on pollinators, on tick-borne disease. So there are a lot of these already generated. If there's one you think should be generated, that would be an option to um, ask ESA to lead a, lead a committee on developing these. These live on the ESA website. Um, again, so, and then the other thing that ESA is doing has started this uh, Science Policy Fellows Program. So now we are in the third class of Science Policy Fellows. So, um, we have 15 fresh faces from ESA that are being trained in how to be advocates for science policy. Uh, so that's a lot of human entomologists engaging with, law, with uh, policy makers that are putting a face to our science and getting our science on the radar. And so uh, we're making trips to DC twice a year, and so is there more and more of us uh, we're really magnifying our, our impact and our visibility on, on, in DC. Um, and then again, this is the ESA website, and we now have a policies and initiatives menu option right front and center um, with all of the information that I just mentioned. So this is a major improvement from where we were not so long ago. This has become a front and center um, part of what we do for, as part of ESA. And so, uh, last, I think it's last, <laughs> I will leave you with who are the future policy advocates of ESA, and I leave you simply with a mirror, because I hope that you all see yourselves reflected in uh, becoming the next generation of policy advocates, because ultimately it's something that we should all be doing and can all be doing. So thank you very much.